My name is Sebastian Major, and I am the host of the Our Fake History podcast. I'm Rebecca Larson with the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. This is Greta Harden. My name is Benjamin Jacobs. I'm Anton. And I'm Rick. I'm David Montgomery. I'm Brie. My name is Roberto Toro. I'm Jamie. And I'm Rob. We will be speaking at Intelligent Speech. I am looking forward to speaking at Intelligent Speech 2023. I will be speaking at Intelligent Speech online this year. Mark your calendars for this November 4th. Intelligent Speech, the online conference for history fans by history podcasters. It's a three ring circus of fascinating content with around 24 hours of live presentations. This year is all about contingencies. Times when history meets the unexpected. The topic of my keynote address is no contingencies. The tutors and their contingency plans. So go to intelligencespeechonline.com to get your tickets. We'll see everybody on November 4th. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we watched as Rodama, the Mpanjaki Merina, initiated his long journey to transition the identity and material status of his kingdom. No longer would his kingdom be Imerina, the medieval kingdom founded by Andrea Maniello, ruled from a one-room hut Besacana. No, through a series of treaties with the British and extensive military conquest, Rodama's kingdom projected the image of the Kingdom of Madagascar, a modern, enlightened empire, as founded by his father, Andrea Nampoin Imerina, and ruled at the multi-story Silver Palace at Tranavola. On the surface, it seemed like Rodama's plan was progressing well. However, the short-term success of Rodama's modernization projects were, in fact, underpinned by enormous subsurface tensions and brewing problems that threatened to collapse and reverse any initial progress made. Season 4, Episode 17, Modernizing Madagascar Part 2, The Forges of Amurunke. The early 1820s seemed to be a period of massive triumph for the kingdom of Imerina, the Merina monarchy had more than secured its position as the true hegemonic power on the island, and had made significant progress in embodying the idea of a kingdom of Madagascar. By now, more than two-thirds of the island was under Radama's control. The army of his kingdom of Madagascar, now possessing a permanent number of almost 40,000 men, dwarfed any other force present on the island. The schools proliferating in the interior regions were now creating a generation of literate students, while architects worked to combine Western and local traditions to initiate a golden age of Malgasy architecture. The children of Malgasy noblemen studied abroad to learn new languages, as well as agricultural and manufacturing processes, which they could then bring back and spread among their countrymen. But beneath this glistening exterior that seemingly heralded a new era of prosperity, a dangerous future was brewing under the surface. The reality of Radama's Madagascar was a bit less promising than it seemed. For starters, let's talk about the economy. Now, it would be understandable to believe that the economy of Imerina was performing incredibly well under Radama. After all, how could Radama afford to build massive military investments and building projects if the economy was not performing well? Well, in a surprising twist, uh, that was exactly what he was doing. Ever since Radama's conquest of Tomasina, the economy of Imerina had undergone a considerable slump. While the causes of the slump were multifaceted, these facets mostly derived, directly or indirectly, from the most radical reform found within the anglo merina Treaty of 1817, the abolition of Merina participation in the slave trade. Remember that while it was a relatively small piece of the Malgasy economic pie compared to the most intense slaving regions in Africa, the slave trade was still a crucial component of the Merina economy. This had become especially true during the rule of Andre Dampoini Merina and the early rule of Radama. These kings each fought a plethora of small wars and conflicts, both to expand their influence over neighboring realms or to reconsolidate their hold over a rebellious region. These wars were very costly, but their losses were partially recouped in the form of captured enemy soldiers and civilians who could then be sold into slavery for a profit. Now, slave trading was already an industry in decline when Radama took the throne. The British abolition of their participation in slave trading put a serious dent in the demand for enslaved workers in Southeast Africa. The colony of Mauritius, once the main source of European demand for enslaved African labor, continued to use enslaved labor from those born into slavery on the island, but legally phased out the practice of importing African enslaved workers. Eventually, even the underground trade of enslaved laborers to Mauritius began to die down, when it was phased out by a new system of Indian and, to a lesser extent, 
Chinese indentured workers, who the British called the pejorative phrase, coolies. These new laborers were paid very little, if at all, and their unfree labor often looked, sounded, and smelled like slavery, but totally wasn't slavery, guys, trust me. The Chinese diaspora in Mauritius is a particularly fascinating subject, with the descendants of these original Chinese laborers still having an enormous impact on the history, culture, and economics of Mauritius to this very day. So if you'd like to learn more about the proportionately largest Chinese community in Africa, please check out our newest premium episode on Chinese Mauritians at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. We also just put up a poll to determine the subject of the big special episode that will come out at the end of this season. So if you'd like to have your voice heard in dictating the future of what topics we study, or if you'd like to listen to our now almost 50 premium episodes, or if you'd just like to support our project of free online history education, then please support the show at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. And to those already supporting the show, a heartfelt thank you. Even as indentured laborers became the primary form of unfree workers on the island, some planters on Mauritius continued to try and skirt British anti-slave trade laws and kept on clandestinely importing enslaved people from Madagascar and elsewhere. But this underground demand could not replace the old market, and the crashing demand for enslaved workers led to a crashing price. In 1810, the selling price of an enslaved worker from Madagascar was the equivalent of roughly 240 US dollars today. Seven years later, that price had plummeted to merely a little over $120, just over half their original economic value. This was the context of the slave trade when Radama officially made his decision to abolish it in Imerina. Even then, he knew that a transition away from the dying industry would be difficult from the Merina economy, so Radama pressed the British into supplying his kingdom with generous subsidies to help him weather the storm. It was with these hopes in mind that he signed the 1817 treaty. But by 1824, it was clear that Radama had severely underestimated the impact that the abolition of the slave trade would have. While yes, the industry was on the decline, it was still a major economic force in the region. Not only did many planters in Mauritius and other Mascarene islands continue evading British slave trading bans, but the largest buyer of enslaved Malgasy, the spice plantations on the East African coast, continued to desire enslaved workers without interruption. British smugglers and East African merchants continued coming to Malgasy ports looking to buy enslaved laborers, and when they noticed that Merina-controlled ports no longer offered any, they turned elsewhere. As a result, the abolition of the slave trade didn't just destroy the Merina trade in slaves, but greatly weakened Merina trade in, well, everything else. The ships just weren't stopping by in the same quality. Radama's expensive wars further exacerbated the problem. In order to support his ambitious conquests, Radama arranged for a major portion of the British subsidies to be paid in the form of military supplies. This did surely help the army, and was probably a big portion of why Radama was able to wage these wars in the first place. But it also meant that the funds meant to ease Imerina's transition away from the slave trading economy were not being used for their original purpose. But Radama's plans to overcome the economic woes following the abolition of the slave trade extended well beyond a mere stipend from a foreign power. In a meeting at the roof of Antanarifu, confronted by angry nobles and bureaucrats who wondered why they weren't allowed to sell slaves to foreigners anymore, Radama attempted to convince them that the abolition of the slave trade would actually be a good thing for Imanina in the long term. His rationale was that each enslaved worker not sold to a foreign merchant was an additional body to work a field, dig a ditch, or excavate a mine. To replace the revenue lost from slave trading, Imerina, and by extension the other conquered portions of the island, would have to develop new industries to replace it. With the abolition of the slave trade, Radama initiated a new set of policies to vault Imerina's economy into a new era. The Merina industrial experiment was about to begin. So before we introduce the following epoch of Malgasy history, much of which will hinge on the idea of becoming a so-called industrialized economy, I think it's important to introduce what exactly we're even talking about here. Now it's worth noting that this idea of industrialization will be quite simplistic for the sake of time. As I said last time I introduced the effects of industrialization on an African economy, in that case the Ashanti Empire, Questions of the Industrial Revolution's causes, effects, and what it even necessarily constituted are each the object of close examination and heated debate 
to the point where multiple respected scholars of history, political science, economists, or other relevant fields may develop radically divergent views on the matter. So part of the difficulty with discussing historical industrialization is that the concept is hard to define without kind of assuming that the other person already knows what it is. It's often given the Jacob Ellis v. Ohio treatment, where very few people can give a working definition of industrialization, but, well, you know it when you see it. For the purposes of this podcast, it is pretty important to showcase how we define industrialization, since we will be dedicating a great deal of time and energy to determining to what exact extent the Empire of Madagascar was or was not an industrialized economy. The idea of defining industrialization is made harder by a misleading name. The concept of industry is related but not synonymous with the idea of being industrial. So an industry simply refers to any sort of economic field defined by the creation of a shared product or service. An individual baking and selling cookies, for example, is in the cookie industry. A film actor or screenwriter is in the movie industry. But in the context of the Industrial Revolution, nobody's talking about industries in this sense of the world. If someone asked you to name an industrial job and you said screenwriter, they'd probably give you a pretty confused look. Rather, in this historical context, industry refers to typically manufacturing, mechanical labor, or mechanized resource extraction. Well, okay, there we have it. Imagine as industrialized. It's a country which had several iron mines, and that's resource extraction. It also had many specialized craftsmen who manufactured products like guns, tools, and pottery. You know, manufacturing. So, Imerina was already an industrialized economy. We figured it out, and the podcast is over. Well, not quite. What most people are referring to when picturing industrialization is, in fact, coordinated and mechanized industry. This type of industry must be mechanized in that it makes use of complex machinery to significantly increase production and coordinated, as in that the means of production, as well as labor, are coordinated with the intention to reach an ideal level of production. So when we talk about industries and industrializing, we're looking for coordinated economic forms using complex machinery to maximize profit in manufacturing or resource extraction. That is at least a simpler definition that we'll use to avoid getting truly sucked down a rabbit hole here. I know it's not perfect. Depending on what you consider a complex machine, the idea of industrialization actually long precedes the Industrial Revolution. You could argue that industrialization has roots as far back as the ancient past and in every region of the world. The Roman Empire, Song Dynasty, Medieval India, Italy, and the Netherlands each featured such large firms using complex machinery and coordinated labor for mass productivity. Even just focusing on Africa, there are plenty of examples. Archaeological evidence from natural draft furnaces from early medieval Burkina Faso show potential evidence for coordinated commercial ironworking, with the same being true for bellows furnaces in Meroe, Sudan. But economic and technological historians don't usually label these as industrialization. Rather, these breakthroughs and similar ones are pre-industrialization, or forms of production which share a lot in common with mechanized industry, but were ultimately isolated and didn't fundamentally transform global production of goods. Rather, the wave of industrialization that changed human history forever, the famous Industrial Revolution, is usually marked as beginning in the mid-18th century in the British Isles. Again, the debate around why it rose there in particular is, to understate things, a matter of contentious argumentation. The Industrial Revolution in Britain was also not a singular event with a start and end, but the culmination of multiple already ongoing economic trends and cascading effects. The widespread availability of relatively shallow in the British Isles is just one of many examples of potential causative factors behind why such a phenomenon started in Britain. British coal deposits allowed for the fueling of early versions of the steam engine, as well as newer, more heat-intensive but efficient blast furnaces for processing iron ore. With iron and steel more available, new machines became practical to build and invent. The British textile industry evolved rapidly, from individual sewing machines to more efficient spinning jenny machines, to large water and coal-powered machines which could spin hundreds of fibers at a time. 
Further iterations on these machines allowed mechanical looms to be able to sew hundreds of different patterns, with their patterns dictated by punched paper cards. These machines, and the growing number of factories utilizing them, fundamentally transform not only British, but global society. These machines, and the growing number of factories utilizing them, fundamentally transform the society around them. A growing number of people began to work in factories, at first part-time between harvests, and then full-time. Workers were more productive, but more alienated from the product of their labor. The national economy of Britain, meanwhile, soared. To give a reference of just what an enormous development the rise of an industrial economy was, England's estimated GDP growth from 1750 AD to 1800 AD was twice as large as the combined GDP growth of the previous five centuries. That's right, all of the economic growth from 1250 until 1750 was approximately half of the growth that took place between 1750 and 1800. By the time that Radama came to power, the Industrial Revolution was still in, well, maybe not its infancy, but a toddler at the oldest. Now, the idea of an Industrial Revolution is a little bit anachronistic, since nobody was waking up and going to work thinking, dang, it sure is crazy that we're living in the Industrial Revolution, TM. But people certainly knew that things were changing quickly, especially in the places where industrialization was occurring the fastest. By the year 1820, just after the capture of Tuomasina, Britain was still essentially the only fully industrialized economy on Earth. A couple of other countries, like the United States and a little bit in France, Austria, and Germany, were also in the early stages of industrialization during this time, but they had not made anywhere near the same leaps of productivity that England had. One man who sought to imitate Britain's newfound economic productivity was the man who had just signed a treaty with them, Radama the Mpanjaka Madagascara. Starting in 1823, the economic problems linked to the abolition of the slave trade were beginning to come home to roost. In addition to falling exports, the treaty clause which provided free trade between Imerina and British merchants were beginning to cause serious issues for the Merina royal coffers. Trade duties, whether extracted from foreign merchants entering Merina territories or from the funds collected by royal trade agents, had long been a pillar of Merina state finances. The signing of the Treaty of 1817 made collecting duties on British merchants essentially impossible. Compounding with these economic problems, Radama's relationship with the British was beginning to slightly falter for entirely different reasons, which will be discussed in depth next episode. With the relationship beginning to come undone and royal coffers running dry, Radama decided to raise the tariffs at Tuamasina, and try a new economic approach. Instead of relying on free trade with the British, Radama would try to build an independent, sovereign, and self-sufficient manufacturing economy, one which imitated the rumors of enormous productive facilities being fed to him by students returning from their studies abroad. To do so, Imerina would have to adopt the newly burgeoning technologies that were fueling Britain's own meteoric economic rise. Imerina had to industrialize. So, before we can get into how Radama sought to transform the productive economy of Imerina, we should probably first talk about the state of that productive economy before 1820. So, as we mentioned a few episodes ago, Imerina in the 19th century had been reorganized into a firmly mercantile state. Trade between various industries within the state were bought and sold primarily by official agents of the Merina crown. Apart from the largest economic sector in the region, which was farming, Imerina had developed the largest crafts and manufacturing economy in Madagascar. The craftsmen were typically highly skilled and highly specialized workers, almost always from a low-level Andreana bloodline. For example, the Sandra Lambu, a caste of Andreana who could trace their most recent royal lineage to King Ralambu, were especially prolific in the silk industry. They specialized in high-class luxury silk, used in burial shrouds and expensive garments. The family line descended from one of Rolambu's uncles were regarded as the greatest weaponsmiths, who specialized in the manufacturing and repair of muskets, ammunition, and swords. Lower caste smiths, such as those from wealthier Hofa families, typically worked in less prestigious positions as the manufacturers of jewelry, bells, and coins made from silver, gold, and copper. The weaving and manufacturing sectors were pretty standard to the rest of the world in the early 19th century, 
and fit the mold of a traditional crafts economy. Radama, however, noticed that the existing industries were lagging behind their equivalents in Britain. British goods were becoming cheaper and more plentiful with every passing year. If Radama was to boost his own economic outcomes, he would need to know the same secret of manufacturing that was letting the British destroy other European nations in productivity. With this goal in mind, Radama initiated what could fairly be considered the first state-run, purpose-driven attempt to industrialize in history. The first step of Radama's plan was a dramatic raise in Merina trade duties at Tuamasina. The commitment to free trade with the British was revoked, and the tariff to trade in the Merina was raised gradually from a mere 5% to over 25% of the value of a sale. The new tariff fulfilled two goals for the Merina state. It made British goods in the Merina more expensive, allowing local producers to compete with them even if they lacked the same advanced productive technologies. Next, it raised significant revenue for the Merina state, giving the government more money to invest into industrializing firms. One of the first attempts to create an industrialized economic sector in Madagascar began in 1826. That year, Radama made contact with a merchant from Réunion named Napoleon de la Stelle. De la Stelle, descended from French ship captains on his father's side and free mixed-race Creole elites on his mother's, was a man whose economic fortune was on the decline. His family's wealth had been invested in the fellow French colony of Mauritius, only for those investments to suddenly disappear when the British captured the island. Desperate for an opportunity to refill his family coffers, de la Stelle jumped at Radama's offer to begin setting up new businesses. Now, commercial plantations were not unknown in Imerina, but the crops de la Stelle planted, coffee and vanilla, were new. Importantly, though, these plantations sought not only to grow, but also to mechanically process the crops, and then sell them as finished products. For now, these plantations remained small, and de la Stelle left Madagascar for France just two years later in an unsuccessful effort to encourage further French investment in the eastern section of Madagascar. This is far from the last time we'll hear from him, though. De La Stelle will definitely be back. French and Creole businessmen weren't the only foreigners investing in Madagascar. Garment and textile manufacturing also underwent enormous shifts in this era. Along with French businessmen, five Bengali silk growers immigrated from the regions of modern Bangladesh and India to open new silkworm farms near Tuamasina. Bengal was one of the most productive silk-growing regions in the world, and the Bengali silk growers insisted on bringing the methods of silk production that they were familiar with to Madagascar. They imported Indian species of silkworm instead of using local varieties, as well as importing Indian species of mulberry bush for their worms to feed on. Meanwhile, a man named Raulum Bolena, a Merina nobleman, and one of the many children who had been sent to study abroad in Britain, returned to Madagascar as a grown man, and founded a garment factory along with a British business partner. Ralum Bolena had studied in Manchester, one of the earliest hubs of British industrialization, and applied what he learned in his new garment factory to great success. The factory was manned by dozens of corvée and enslaved workers, who toiled to produce great numbers of lamba, the traditional merina cloak, among other garments to sell to foreign sailors. The largest foreign industrialists, though, were the London Missionary Society. Radama put several London missionaries who happened to have backgrounds in crafts and manufacturing to work, setting up factories and training Malgasi managers. Some of these crafts included leather tanning, carpentry, gunpowder manufacturing, and cotton weaving. While the growth of these other industries was impressive, the sector in which Radama invested the bulk of state resources was iron processing. The iron industry had been one of the key sectors of the Merina economy for years, and even before the rise of Radama, a few small organized forges had popped up throughout highland Madagascar. However, Radama sought to invigorate the industry with a surplus of skilled labor. One of the upsides to the recent wars of conquest was that, alongside more ordinary people, skilled workers were often among those enslaved by the Merina armies, resulting in an influx of educated workers to be put to use on Falampuana Corves. Additionally, in 1823, Radama organized the first census taken in Malgasi history, which allowed him to precisely arrange and make use of the exact number of eligible workers for the labor draft. Now, the Falampuana, of course, had been around since the earliest periods of the Merina Kingdom, and when Radama was inaugurated as king, 
the Falun Puana had at first been used largely for the same purposes it always had been, agricultural labor and infrastructural labor. Rodama, on the other hand, sought to use the Falun Puana for an entirely different purpose, bolstering the number of ironsmiths. Under Radama, the ironworking of Imerina reached a new level of productivity, since he was the first in Panjaka Imerina to actually assign large numbers of Panampuana to work iron. To give an example of how radically Radama shifted the priorities of the Panampuana, here's a comparison between how Radama and his predecessor utilized the Panampuana labor corvée. Under Andrea Nampuani Merina, 78% of available skilled Panampuana were assigned to work in agriculture. 17% were assigned to military service or engineering, and a little under 5% were used in general construction projects like roads, bridges, walls, and houses. Now, under Radama, for starters, the total number of skilled workers rose by an enormous factor of 13 times. But despite this enormous increase, the number of total workers in agriculture remained essentially the same. As the agricultural sector continued growing while the number of Fanampuana workers remained stagnant, the gap in labor was increasingly filled by enslaved workers in their place. Meanwhile, more than two-thirds of the total skilled Fanampuana were dedicated to metallurgy, another fifth were dedicated to construction projects, and a bit over 2% were dedicated to textile manufacturing and mining. In addition to restructuring the sectors in which Fanampuana corvées worked, Radama also dramatically extended the length of the average term of service. Under Radama's father, the average length of Falampuana service was a little under a month each year. Under Radama, it could easily result in months or even years away from home at a time. The influx of workers into the metallurgy industry in particular grew the sector at a dramatic rate. What had previously been small facilities rapidly expanded into industrial-scale operations. The most visible sign of progress in ironworking took place at Amorunque, the new center of ironworking in Imerina. The exurb of Antanarifu was named Amorunque because of the scale of its industrial smelting. The name means the edge of the burning land, and was derived from the constant burning of trees around its fringes to produce charcoal, the main fuel source for the furnaces. Ore was carried to Amorunque from dozens of miles southeast where it was mined on the shores of Lake Itasie. Bolstered by the new influx of Fanampuana labor, the site, which was previously only home to a few small operations, grew quickly into a major center of iron metallurgy. By 1826, Amorunke featured two workshops, with a total of 50 furnaces divided between them. Each furnace, composed of a 4-foot deep and 2-foot diameter sandstone forge, was fueled by two large man-operated bellows. During a visit to the furnaces a few decades prior, French explorer Nicolas Mayur recorded that each furnace produced approximately 45 pounds of iron for every four hours of work, meaning that, when fully operated, the Amoronque forges alone produced over 2.25 tons of iron per day. Compared to his other economic ventures, the development of iron manufacturing was by a wide margin Radama's greatest productive success. Radama's early industrial reforms did not single-handedly solve Imerina's woes, but it did have some interesting effects on the country as a whole. Perhaps the biggest transformation was in the rapid urbanization of Antanarifu and Tuamasina. The shifting of Fanampuana labor away from the fields and towards urban construction, metallurgy, and crafts quickly consolidated a growing percentage of the Merina population around Antanarifu. Prior to Radama's rule, Antanarifu was barely a city in the traditional sense of the word. With a population of only between 10 to 15,000 in the year 1800, it wasn't even the largest settlement in Madagascar. By 1827, though, Radama's policies led to the city's rapid proliferation, more than doubling to a population between 35 and 40,000 people. While Tuomasina had a smaller population starting point, in terms of ratio, it experienced an even more impressive growth rate quadrupling in population between 1817 and 1827. Imerina was also preparing a new generation of people to fuel the labor needs of a new industrial revolution. Apart from the returning students who had studied abroad, the missionary schools within Imerina itself had begun graduating a new generation of literate students, ready to serve as managers, foremen, and factory owners for the coming decades. The literacy rate in Imerina 
a demographic which, prior to Radama's rule, contained only a small handful of people educated in Surabe, a mere fraction of a percent of the total population, had risen to an impressive 7 to 10 percent by 1827. Now, a 7 to 10 literacy rate does not seem impressive and is actually extremely low by modern standards. While a literacy rate like that might not seem impressive, and it would be considered extremely low by modern standards, such a rate was actually pretty globally standard at the time. Countries in Western Europe had rapidly expanded their literacy rates by the 19th century, but a rate like 7-10% to would have not been uncommon in Eastern or Central Europe, where regions like Hungary or Southern Italy had comparable literacy rates, while countries like Russia and the Ottoman Empire were considerably lower, hovering around 1-2%. So, by 1828, Radama's kingdom was making major strides in progressing into the king's vision of a modern country, a literate, militarized, and industrialized nation. And then in an unforeseen twist, Radama suddenly died, only at age 35. While it might have been hard to tell from his active and youthful political persona, Radama had actually been in remarkably bad health by the back end of his reign. While the exact details of his death vary from report to report, his early death is usually linked in some manner to the king's supposed abuse of alcohol. Apparently, when it came to coping with the stress of ruling Imerina and its growing island empire, alcohol became an increasingly significant crutch for the Mpanjaka Imerina. Whether he died directly from alcohol poisoning, or more slowly from the gradual erosion of his health from the drink, the result was the same. Despite ruling for only 18 years, Radama's reign had an outside legacy compared to its length. In his relatively short time in power, Radama had thoroughly and totally transformed nearly every facet of Merina politics and daily life. Literacy, while still quite rare, was becoming increasingly accessible. The once almost totally agrarian country now featured a burgeoning industrial sector. The once isolated Madagascar had fully opened to the world, but slightly receded into a more defensive stance when needed. In fact, it's hard to even distinguish at this point what is Imerina and what is Madagascar, as I'm sure Radama would have loved. In a sense, Radama can be thought of as the father of modern Madagascar, as the very concept of a Malagasy nation, well, really starts with his ambitions to unite the island. On the other hand, analyzing the legacy of Radama is impossible without first analyzing how his legacy was carried on by his successor. Due to the sudden and unexpected nature of his demise, Radama had done little to support his favorite to succeed him on the throne. For this reason, Radama's modernization project was briefly put on hold as the movers and shakers of Malgasy politics aimed to place their own factions and powers. And, for the first time since the Faha Fasimba, it would be a woman who took control of the reins of power in Madagascar, Radama's first wife. Join us in our next episode as we observe how a new mind at the head of the state, as well as new conditions emerging in the economy and international affairs of Madagascar, will lead to both the continuity of aspects and radical changes to certain aspects of Radama's project of modernization. As we meet perhaps the most misunderstood ruler in Malagasy history, the so-called Mad Empress Rana Faluna. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayofag Bamie, Morgan Blackmore, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Savalabie, Evan Edwards, Pascal Nwokocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabodike, Shea Unoronti Mine, Kwachu Amankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Hassan Firgiani, Niti, Kitty, and Tariq Beetleman, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.